Hi, this is Chuck Lidkowski and welcome to the next installment of The Handyman for Life. We all are looking for a handyman in life, the one with the right tools and the right touch, who can help us at the right time, and they have the right talents. In the times of Jesus, a handyman was someone who worked with things that were hard, like stone or wood or brick, and we need someone like that because we're all hard-headed, we're all hard-hearted, and we need somebody like that to work with us. This week, we're going to be looking at changing, making a change of pace. We've all been in a rut. We've been in doing the same thing over and over and over again, and we can't get out of that rut. I know I was out west when we lived in Scottsdale, and I went on a trip with ATVs, and we went out in the middle of the desert. It was like the surface of the moon. And we, re we retraced some of the route that was taken by the pioneers. And in the solid rock, there were these ruts where one wagon after another, after another, after another, wore through the rock. And maybe that's where you are in your life, that you've been in this rut that just been doing the same thing over and over and over, and it's time for something new. Zig Ziglar once said, all bad habits start slowly, and gradually, and before you know you have a habit, the habit has you. We all have felt that. We need to do the unexpected. Someone once said, if you do not change direction, you may end up where you are headed. We are all looking in that way. We all have that kind of a personality. And in the early Christian church, they weren't sure what to do. They had no road map. They didn't have some kind of plan. And in Acts chapter 4, they are getting together and they have these problems. It never happens. It, I mean, it never ceases to happen that wherever people get together, there are problems. Somebody once said, if you go looking for a perfect church and you happen to find it, don't join it because you will ruin it. And they were those same kind of people, just like you and me. And these people got together and there were people in that crowd, in that first century church, that were having problems. They couldn't feed themselves. They didn't have enough money. So what did they do? They brought their money together and they put it into a pile and they met the needs of one another. This was highly unusual. They were responding to tough times. As a community, they were responding. They prayed together. They worked together. They worshiped together. They learned together and they gave together. And this is really something that in our heart of hearts, don't you want to be part of a community like that? Don't you want to be able to give to people who are genuinely in need? And aren't there times when you have a need that you want someone who can put their arm around you and maybe say, here, let me help you. Let me encourage you. And also let me help make your needs. Acts 4.32 records that while the whole group of those who believe were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. This was not communism. This is free enterprise, and they freely gave what they had earned. Every person who was able to give, gave. And they didn't hold it to themselves, and they didn't say, well, you can only use it like this. They gave up their rights. They gave up their ownership. And there was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned land or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each one as they had, had need. I mean, it was an amazing process. People who had more sold and then gave the money back to the leadership and said, you can distribute it. This is the way it works. This is how we're going to show that God has been kind to us. And since he has been so kind to us, we worship him, we rejoice. And because he has given to us, we want to give to other people. And in there, there was a Levite named a native of Cyrus. Joseph was his name, to whom the apostles gave the name, they gave him the name Barnabas which means son of encouragement. Here is a man who appears in the pages of the Bible as a historic character. He wasn't some made-up guy, wasn't a cartoon, wasn't a figment of their imagination. They really give some very details about this guy. First, the man. 
he was a Levite. That's He was from a certain tribe. And the Levites had certain roles and responsibilities within the nation of Israel. They were the priests. They were the ones who offered the sacrifices. They are the ones who offered and did the work at the temple. And he was of from Cyprus, which was an island in the middle of the Mediterranean. And the one thing to think about is they're in Jerusalem, and here's this guy from Cyprus. He's not from around here. He didn't grow up here. He's, you know, he's not necessarily one of us. But did they hold that against him? Did they say, well, you're from a, a, another land. You, you don't speak the same way we do. You don't look the same way we do. No, they welcomed him and they gave him a name, a son of encouragement. That name means that he was the kind of a person who would come up beside somebody. That's where encouragement is. That's exactly what he did. And he sold a field that belonged to him, Acts 4.37. Then he brought the money and he laid it at the apostles' feet. This is an amazing story. Here is this wealthy guy. His name is really Joseph, but they called him Barnabas because his personality, one of being an encouragement, overwhelmed who he was, who his mother named him, and where he was from. They said, you're from a different area. You have a certain cultural background but you have been encouraging to us. And we see that moment where he lays it down in humility, just like everybody else did. He didn't say, well, here's the money and then let me, you know, dole it out. Or here's the money, now you sign a release. Or here, you put up a big sign and you tweet about all the money that I'm giving you with humility. It doesn't say he threw it at their feet. He laid it at their feet. How do you lay something at somebody's feet? You get down. You bend down. It's a sign of respect. It's a sign of being under their authority. And he did that. And there's deep meaning behind all of this. First of all, he owned property. Now you might think, well, that just means that he was rich and, and that's interesting, isn't it? And that's encouraging. But there was something more to it. Back in that time, in that day, remember it said that he was a Levite. He was a member of a certain tribe of people that I mentioned earlier. And one of the things that many people don't realize is that Levites didn't own any land. They weren't given any land. When the nation of Israel left Egypt and came eventually into the promised land, they d divided it up between all the tribes and go look. You won't find any land for the Levites anywhere. That's because God claimed that he would be their possession, that he would do it. And he sold the land. He is admitting publicly, you know what? I did something that I wasn't really supposed to do. You know, have you ever done that where there's a part of your past? You say, I've got to make it known and I've got to get rid of it. There are times in our lives when it comes for total clarity. For you and for me to come before the people of God and say, you know what? He died for all of us. And he rose from the dead for all of us. And one of the things that he's doing is he's changing my life. And it's now time for me to sell and to lay it down. He released his rights to what was his. He washed his hands, if you will. He untied it and gave it away. He was saying, there once was a time when I was Joseph and I was a rich man and I held all these things and I was a Levite. But I've changed. God has changed me. I'm now for a stranger, but I've come to become fr a friend of yours. I once was a priest, someone who was set aside, but now I'm just a normal guy. I once was a rich guy, but now I'm on the same level as you and I'm laying it down. Is this you? Is this where you have things about your life, about your past that, say, that define you? 
Remember the parable Jesus tells about the rich man and Lazarus. How is the rich man described? He is a rich man. And then there's Lazarus. The rich man is defined by his riches. He's defined by who he is. He's defined by what he owns. And here in North America, that is a plague on all of us. What owns me? What defines me? What am I in possession of? Does it possess me? What about my role as husband, a business person, a grandmother, a grandfather, a teacher? Have I sold myself or does it own me? Do you and I need to take that same step? Do we need to sell the thing that holds us? Have we sold ourselves and now it's time to be released? And the only way to release it is to sell it. And then he laid it down. Jim Elliott wrote in his journal, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. He, he wrote those magnificent words, and they are so true. We can try to hold on to our possessions. We can try to hold on to relationships. We can try to hold on to power. Try to hold on to position. And they just slip through our fingers. Barnabas, son of encouragement, demonstrated that God had encouraged and forgiven him of a past and was willing to not only make it public, but to give it away. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, we were bought with a price. We are all tied to whatever owns us. So the question is, what owns you and what owns me? Like the rich man or Lazarus, what defines who you are? Being a Christian is not having a set of rules. Being a Christian is not saying, well, I, I am a conservative politically. It, being a Christian isn't about what do I do with 90 minutes on Sunday morning. Being a Christian is someone who says, I once was trying to control my own life and I can't control it. I give you, God, control of my life. And that happens as we ask Jesus to be our, our Lord, our boss, our Savior. And we turn to God, who maybe you were thinking of as a grouchy old man. But he wants to be your Papa, your Daddy. One who loves you. One who gave his own son for you. Will we open our hearts up? Will we be transformed like Barnabas from a Joseph to the son of encouragement? From someone who was holding on to his past who could release it? Maybe you say, but Chet, you don't understand my past. That's right, I don't. But God does, and he never shames you. He never says, get away from you. He never says, he always says, come close. He always says with open arms, my son, my daughter, welcome home. That's the kind of great God and the forgiveness that he offers to you and to me. Won't we receive it? Let me pray. Our Father and our God, I thank you that you're that kind of God. The God who loves, the God who gives, the God who gave away your only son, the one who opens up your arms to receive us. We were bought with a price. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks so much for joining us. God bless and bye-bye.